Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sonis of FanDuel. And Jim, way too much positivity from us over the last few shows. And we talked about winners after round one, players whose stock is up after the draft. Now, unfortunately, it's time to talk about some of the players whose stocks are falling after the draft. What's happening, Jim? Yeah, it's all good, Greg. Like you said, is some stocks go up, some got to go down. There is always an equilibrium here, and we're talking about the downsides here today, and there are a lot of them. Hopefully, these guys are not on your Dynasty rosters, as several of them are mine, and uh, you can be a little bit more happy with how things stand after the draft. How are you doing today, Greg? You know, my stock's pretty much in the middle right now, so... I'll take that as a win at this point. All right, let's begin our stock down portion of the hurry up. We begin well, kind of where we left off yesterday. I told you I was excited to talk about Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love, and that's where we're going to begin. Aaron Rodgers' stock is falling, but it may not be because of Jordan Love. We don't expect him to make much of an impact this year, but it's what the Packers did or didn't do around him which has a stock falling for me. Yeah, it's all about opportunity cost here for Aaron Rodgers. There are actually two things working against him. The, the big one is that opportunity cost because taking Jordan Love did mean that they could potentially have a starter down the road, but it also means they did not address other needs. And the Packers have a lot of other needs. It's not just the pass catchers. And the pass catchers are a major thing, but also they lost their right tackle, Brian Bulaga. And yeah, they've got depth to help fill that role they signed Ricky Wagner and they've got some other guys who were there last year who could fill that gap but it's going to be a downgrade at right tackle regardless so you could have expected Rodgers to take a step back in 2020 even though he wasn't that great to begin with in 2019 from a fantasy perspective but then you factor in that they didn't add the pass catches and right now their top guys are going to be Devontae Adams, Devin Funches, and Alan Lazard and I think that Lazard is interesting Devin Funches in the past has been an okay player but that's not the type of core outside of Devonte Adams who elevates the quarterback's production. Pretty much every quarterback outside of maybe Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes is dependent on their environment. Rodgers is no different. He needs guys around him to perform in order to get a boost to his, his stats. So I think that the downside there, the long-term outlook, outlook is also negative because there's a chance that Rodgers, maybe the team views him as being on the decline. I think that some stats will back that up as well. So that's, it's also a little bit concerning here as well. So both from a short-term and long-term outlook, Rodgers' stock is down for fantasy football. And that's a tough thing from a dynasty perspective. Maybe you can find someone who will buy into the angry Aaron Rodgers narrative and take him off your hands for you. But things definitely pretty grim here, both in the short and long term. That's not exactly how you want to see things by any means. And it's really tough to get jazzed about Aaron Rodgers, whether it be for 2020 or going forward based on what happened this weekend. When Tom Brady officially left New England, a lot of people pointed to the fact that New England didn't do enough around Brady to improve. The wide receivers outside of Julian Edelman were kind of barren. You nobody to throw to. You look at Green Bay and you wonder if Aaron Rodgers is thinking the same thing that Tom Brady is, that, hey, what about me? How are you going to help me as I age, as I'm not the same player I was in my prime? Sure, he has Devontae Adams a little bit better than Julian Edelman. But after that, Devin Funches? Like, this is, this is what we're doing here? It's not going to be good enough. Alan Lazard, as much as I love the Lizard, not going to be good enough. Rodgers needs help. Packers didn't give him help. Jordan Love, well, hopefully by the time he's quarterback, Packers will do a little bit more around him than they did around Rodgers. Speaking of Tom Brady and his former team doing the Patriots, that brings us to Jarrett Stidham, who on the surface you'd think, this guy's a winner from draft weekend because Patriots did not draft another quarterback and not one of the big four quarterbacks that were drafted in the first round. But you think his stock is down a little bit here, Jim, which is kind of surprising. How come? Yeah, I think that if you have Jared Sidham in a super flex dynasty league, you should be ecstatic because starting quarterbacks are currency in those formats. And his value just went up there. That is undeniable. The stock for Jared Sidham went up. But at the same time, the odds that Jared Sidham succeeds as a starting quarterback for New England went down because they didn't really do a whole lot to add talent around him. And you look back to last year, Tom Brady finished 22nd in the league in per drop back efficiency based on the numbers at number fire. And Jared Sidham is not as good of a quarterback as Tom Brady. You can be into Jared Sidham as a prospect, but to say he is as good as Tom Brady was last year is a little bit of a stretch. Now, there were some re-additions by injury because they get David Andrews back. He was medically cleared to play once again, their center. Uh, Isaiah Wynn may be healthy the full year. They get a full year of Nikhil Harry, Mohamed Sanu. So maybe you could count those as being additions because they'll be there for the full season for New England, whereas they were not there last year. 
But is that enough? Is that enough to elevate Jared Siddham, who was a later round pick last year, didn't have great efficiency stats at Auburn, and was an older prospect coming out because he was a transfer? There were a lot of questions about Jared Siddham's profile, even if you do buy into what he did earlier on in his career before that transfer and before going to a tougher offense out in Auburn. So you can be into Jared Stidham. And I think that, uh, again, his stock did go up technically because they didn't draft a quarterback during the NFL draft. But if you are sitting here right now and you have Jared Stidham on a dynasty super flex roster, I think you got to trade him out because the odds that he is super successful in this year as the Patriots quarterback are not all that high based on the talent around him and his stock may never be higher. So yes, in theory, Jared Siddham could qualify as a winner, but I think if you're thinking long-term and trying to figure out the odds he holds down this job and performs well enough to be the long-term starter for New England, I think those odds actually went down. So you want to play into the perception here and hope people are excited that Stidham is in line to be the starter now for New England because I don't think the outlook when he gets that starting role is all that optimistic. So he's technically a winner, but also kind of a loser. So a little bit confusing, uh, but I definitely think now is the time to sell on Jared Stidham based on what the Patriots did in this draft. All those tight ends aren't good enough. You'd be buying Jared Stidham stock right now. They're interesting. I think that's for sure. But are they going to stretch the field and be legit downfield threats? We don't know. And I think that's kind of what they're missing in this offense. Maybe that can be Nikhil Harry, but there's still a lot to be proven. We've seen the value of having, you know, downfield threats in the NFL and not sure the Patriots have one of those right now. So I don't see the upside there for Jared Sitta. Maybe he gets you a floor, but the upside still very much in question. The upside in question, it's, not, it's weird because Jared Sitta, a winner of the draft weekend, but his stock is also down at the draft weekend. A little bit confusing there with Jared Sitta. One player whose stock is dramatically down, I believe, is Devin Singletary in Buffalo. We were hoping and praying Buffalo would not bring another running back. Unleash Devin Singletary, as we saw uh, during the playoffs last season. Unfortunately, that exactly wasn't the case for Buffalo. Yeah, it definitely wasn't. And it sounds like things could be pretty grim here for Devin Singletary, based on what they've been saying about Zach Moss since the NFL draft because I think that when they took Zach Moss you kind of knew that he would eat into the early down work for Devin Singletary and that's okay but once you dig into what Zach Moss did at Utah you see that he did get some passing down work and was not a, a negative in the passing game by any means so there's a chance he could get some work there and also he profiles as being a legitimate goal line back and Singletary already had questions about his touchdown upside because Josh Allen is also essentially a goal line back in that offense. So there was one guy to take away opportunities there. Now Moss is another one within this offense. So I think that we still could see a scenario in which Devin Singletary gets maybe double digit carries per game and can get five or so targets, in which case he'll be flex worthy. That's totally okay. But if those carries go down anymore and he loses any passing down work, you add on the loss of goal line work, and we start to see a situation where Devin Singletary doesn't carry all that much value for fantasy going forward. Now, that may be the worst case scenario, and I don't want to project that necessarily, necessarily for Devin Singletary, but I think with the initial reaction to the Zach Moss pick, you could have still thought that Singletary would serve a pretty valuable role, but... I think the more you dig in, the more you hear what they say about Zach Moss's outlook in Buffalo, it starts to get a little bit more foggy. So even if uh, you're down on Devin Singletary, it might not be a bad time to see what you can get for him out there, see people buy into the talent because the touchdown upside basically non-existent at this point, and there's a chance things could get even worse once we get into the actual season. Yeah, I think it remains to be seen what kind of role um, that Zach Moss is going to play on this team. You, you did hear... Uh, what Brandon Bean was saying, what Sean McDermott was saying about him being a goal line guy, getting some early down work, and you get a little bit nervous. But hopefully they don't exactly forget what Devin Singletary meant to this team down the stretch and how important he was in all facets of the game, early down work, on the goal line, and certainly in the passing game as well. I think Devin Singletary is going to have a role. It's going to be up to him to see how big that car is going to be, though. Another running back who you are wondering about at this point, it's Aaron Jones. He's a very popular target in early rounds last season. But the Packers, when they brought in help for Aaron Rodgers, it was another running back. And it was the phenomenal A.J. Dillon. 
which means Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones, they're going to be fighting for everything that they can get. And that's not exactly great news for their fantasy stock. Yeah, I think there are two big concerns here with Aaron Jones. The first one is how high they took A.J. Dillon because he was a second-round pick. And you don't generally pick guys in the second round to have him sit on the bench. He's probably going to be playing a pretty decent amount. That's probably a bigger concern for Jamal Williams than it is for Aaron Jones. But it's also the type of touches that A.J. Dillon is going to get. Going back to the conversation we just had around Zach Moss is where are the Packers going to go for the money carries toward the goal line? Because Aaron Jones was due for touchdown regression to begin with. He scored 19 total touchdowns last year. That number was going to come down just because it's hard to repeat an outlier type performance. But now you may take away some of those easy chances at touchdowns, which means the regression could be even more egregious for Aaron Jones here if A.J. Dillon does wind up being a goal line type back for this team. Now, Aaron Jones, I think the floor for him is still being the main receiving down back for this team and probably getting more carries per game than A.J. Dillon. But you take away some of those money carries and spread out that early down work even a bit more and things get a little bit hazy. And once again, the Packers did not do a whole lot to address their skill position guys outside of A.J. Dillon, which means that the touchdown upside for this offense in general may be muted if they can't move the ball. So I think there are a lot of concerns here for Aaron Jones. Now, I think it's, this is due for a word of caution here, that people could overreact to the addition of A.J. Dillon. Because again, I think this impacts Jamal Williams more so than Aaron Jones. So while I was kind of okay selling low on Devin Singletary, I'd see what the market is for Aaron Jones. And don't overreact to this because, again, he's a very talented player. He's probably still going to get the passing down work, which is where he can be really good. So I don't think we need to necessarily abandon ship here. And if people are going to lowball you, don't bail. You know, hang on to Aaron Jones and see what happens. But it does at least necessitate seeing what the value is for Aaron Jones, seeing if you can get, uh, you know, good value in return because the, the amount of draft capital spent in A.J. Dillon and the potential for even more harsh touchdown regression does scare me quite a bit with Aaron Jones. Jim, at the beginning of that, you used a really good word that was hazy, and that's what kind of this backfield for Green Bay is between Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones, and now A.J. Dillon. Those 19 touchdowns that you mentioned a few times there for Aaron Jones, they're not replicable. And you bring in A.J. Dillon, we're not exactly sure what his role is going to be, but you do know he's going to have a role, as you said. Being a second-round draft pick, you're not drafted to sit on the bench. Yes, maybe Jamal Williams will be more affected, absolutely. But Aaron Jones is going to lose some carries as well. It's for the first time, really, ever that I can imagine, I don't want to invest in the Packers offense, which means, or invest heavily, I should say, in the Packers offense, which means we're going to pause and kind of wait and see how things play out. Of course, unless you get a draft day bargain. Who would ever thought that Mohamed Sanu would have an effect on Mark Ingram? But it's true. When Mark Ingram, was, I'm sorry, when Mohamed Sanu was traded away to New England, New England gave up a second round pick. And that second round pick went to Atlanta and ultimately wound up in the hands of the Baltimore Ravens, who then drafted J.K. Dobbins, which means Mark Ingram should be angry at Mohamed Sanu. Yeah, definitely, because this really does hurt the, the short-term and the long-term outlook for Mark Ingram. Because when you look at Mark Ingram, his main appeal was that he was a clear-cut top guy in a really good offense that the Ravens would use in high-leverage situations. That was the main appeal for Mark Ingram. Justice Hill wasn't getting the job done. Gus Edwards would come in in garbage time. So, the, you know, there were guys there, but Mark Ingram, when the game mattered, was going to be the guy for the Ravens. Now, that may not be the case because J.K. Dobbins was a legitimate workhorse at Ohio State. This past year, he had 301 carries and 23 receptions, and he had 22 receptions or more all three years he was at Ohio State. So you know that J.K. Dobbins can get the job done in the passing game, and he can carry a major load as a rusher as well. So that hurts the long-term outlook for Mark Ingram because he's probably going to be the replacement for Ingram down the road. But it also hurts his short-term outlook because Dobbins is good and seems more likely to see passing down work and cut into Ingram's role. Before, you know, you had guys like Edwards and like Justice Hill. And when they were on the field, you kind of knew what was going to go down. If it was Gus Edwards, probably a run. Justice Hill, probably a pass. With J.K. Dobbins, it could be either. He's a versatile guy, and he kind of fits more with Mark Ingram and kind of be that guy who can be out there at all times. So Mark Ingram is still going to have a role in 2020 for this Baltimore Ravens offense. They're still going to be run heavy. They're still going to pound the rock and Ingram's still going to benefit from being from that offense being as good as it likely will be. But it's hard to see him having some sort of workhorse type role. And 
it's also potential that we could see J.K. Dobbins get those high leverage touches that Ingram feasted on last year. His workload, his actual usage, straight up usage, wasn't that good to begin with last year. And now there are questions about what that, that workload potentially coming down even more. So Mark Ingram, a pretty big loser here, both in the short and the long term. J.K. Dobbins could be the guy as soon as this year, which is exciting for him for sure. But for Mark Ingram, it's definitely a scary proposition. I'm nervous about Mark Ingram. I'm nervous for what the Baltimore Ravens have in store. I basically feel like I had uh, Justice Hill on my bench all year last year, waiting for him to take over for Ingram. Didn't happen. But the Ravens, who are so good at the draft and so good at maneuvering the draft board, they're not wasting a second-round pick on a running back that they don't plan on giving a ton of touches to. Mark Ingram may be the present, but the present may be getting a little bit more into the past. Because Justice Hill, well, he's not going to be an issue. J.K. Dobbins, he is the present, he is the future. You're investing in him on draft day. One last player whose stock is down coming out of the draft, and unfortunately, that's DeAndre Swift. He was a guy you really liked coming into the draft, and you really liked potentially going in the first round. It didn't happen, and the landing spot, well, that wasn't exactly great either. Yeah, I think that with DeAndre Swift being on this loser list, it's all relative because the landing spot wasn't objectively bad for DeAndre Swift because the Lions do have a good quarterback. We want, you know, we want to tie our our running backs to good quarterbacks. They can score touchdowns. They have a tolerable offensive line. They've got good weapons there. So they can move the ball and score touchdowns. The landing spot itself is not all that bad. The problem that Swift had is that his landing spot wasn't as good as the other top backs in this class. So Swift... It's just fine, his landing spot. Everyone else seemed to land in, in an ideal location from a landing spot perspective. So Swift is going to come down in rookie drafts without actually moving himself. It's just that everyone else moved up, whereas he kind of stayed even with where he was. I think this presents an interesting opportunity here because if Swift does slide in rookie drafts because of this landing spot, I am super intrigued in snagging him because – I love his long-term outlook still. As you mentioned, Greg, I was into him coming into the draft. I still like that because he profiles to get a lot of work in the passing game, which is so, so valuable for running backs in fantasy. And he's going to be that goal line back for the Lions as well. And again, Matthew Stafford is good, offensive line competent. There are a lot of things to like with DeAndre Swift still. So the stock goes down relative to other backs in this class. But that does not mean we should abandon ship on DeAndre Swift. He is still a very valuable dynasty asset. Uh, Carry on Johnson may not be a long-term solution there for the Lions. So it may not even be a timeshare for all that long. So yeah, DeAndre Swift's relative value to other picks in this class did go down. But it's still okay. And I still think that we should be into him uh, if he does wind up sliding a little bit in those rookie drafts. The outlook is still very good. The profile is still really good. And he's still someone who could, who could wind up being a major fantasy stud. So the stock comes down, but still a guy we should be into once those picks come along. It's kind of interesting that you put DeAndre Swift on the stock down list for the reasons they mentioned, but not carry on Johnson. You talk about carry on a little bit there. His stock has to be really falling uh, after this draft pick by the Lions. Yeah, I think that one kind of goes without saying. You could have said the same thing about, you know, like Mark Ingram and Aaron Jones, where it kind of goes without saying. But I think that carry on Johnson, the tea leaves were there. And you could kind of tell that the Lions were going to invest in a running back pretty early. They took one literally at the top end of the second round. So I think that his stock fell the most. Kind of need to talk too much about him. Uh, but I think that, yeah, things are, are pretty tough there between the health, between the, tea, the coaching staffs reluctance to give him a, a major workload even before that so I think it's pretty much kaput here and DeAndre Swift is a guy you want to own both now and in the long term much like J.K. Dobbins DeAndre Swift is the present and the future in Detroit even if you still believe in Bo Scarborough and you're still banking on carry on Johnson well doesn't matter DeAndre Swift is the guy that you're going to want to own for the Lions that's going to do it for us here on the FanDuel Hurry Up Gym we appreciate the time it was awesome hanging out during the draft Uh, The question is, what's next? Great question. I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. Maybe we get NASCAR back soon. Maybe we'll talk Rocket League, which I know nothing about. We'll figure it out, Greg. We're going to play this thing as it goes along. We'll see. All right. I'll be here for it. You'll be here for it. I hope everybody watching, you'll be here too. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sussman. Thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed the hurry up. We'll see you next time. Stay safe, everybody.